All righty, I can see you clearly. <laughs> Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining uh, today for our BPI Chats. I'm your host, Alexandria Maloney, and I hope everyone is staying safe and lifted during this time. The purpose of this series is to share the experiences and insights of members of the international affairs community and hopefully inspire the next generation to explore opportunities in the field. So the thoughts and views of our guest speakers are their own and do not reflect the views of BPIA, and we are currently streaming live and this talk will be posted on our IGTV and our YouTube channel afterwards. So if you haven't already, please follow Black Professionals in International Affairs at IABPIA, as well as our guest speaker whose handle can be found on their flyer on our page. And lastly, we encourage viewers to chime in below in the thread with uh, any comments and questions throughout the talk. So without further ado, I will introduce our guest speaker. Ms. Lydia Nylander has extensive experience in the international development space. She has worked on community engagement projects with the FDIC and the Department of Justice. She was the former Director of Grants and Resource Development at the National Association of Consumer Advocates and former Commissioner of the DC Mayor's Office on African Affairs. She's also a founding board member of Trade Plus Impact, a global platform supporting African female entrepreneurs in the craft and natural cosmetic sectors. She received her Bachelor's of Law at the University of London, Master's in International and Comparative Law from the George Washington University Law School, and was a 2018 Fellow uh, of the International Career Advancement Program at the Aspen Institute. She is currently a senior risk advisor in the U.S. Agency for International Development in their government-to-government -government risk management team, where she's providing technical advice and policy guidance on projects with national, subnational, and sector-level impact related to sustainability and country ownership. So thank you so much, Lydia, for joining us today. You are so <laughs> very welcome. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here and have a conversation with you. So. Yeah. So I'd like to start off by asking how has the COVID-19 situation been affecting the work that you're doing? So, you know, in the great question, first of all, um, I think all international focused agencies are now thinking and turning their attention, not only to, you know, humanitarian response, but also how do we um, instill and support local ownership of, you know, industries, of trade, of health systems, and how do we promote sustainability and self-reliance through what is, you know, an unprecedented global shock. So you're really seeing risk management um, come to the forefront. It hasn't always been the most sexiest part of international <laughs> development and international diplomacy, but risk management is, is the way that we ensure that our programs and our activities abroad are successful and allow us to look for the opportunities that may exist even in, you know, in light of, of the ec epidemic that we are currently experiencing. So the work that we're really doing is about, you know, looking at how we can shore up our global supply chains to make sure that critical, you know, um, supplies and equipment are getting to, the, to their place of origin. Food insecurity, um, looking at ways that we can support our global health colleagues related to HIV AIDS awareness and just a gem an, an, inf an infrastructure support and just a general overall awareness of the critical risks that affect foreign uh, direct foreign assistance and how we can mitigate those as much as possible um so that's really what my work is in is is every day more de more hours than i care to even talk <laughs> about but it's it's rewarding and very satisfying work. You mentioned um, a point about sustainability during this time. Could you share a little bit more about um, work that's being done in that space in terms of, um, is that more supporting individual enterprises or country as a whole, countries as a whole for sustainability? Sure, so you make a really good uh, sort of uh, connection with, you know, humanitarian response and that sort of fast rapid you know we need to focus on people's basic needs 
and sustainability, which is, is how countries really ensure that they are resilient to these types of shocks and shocks in the future. And so sustainability looks like um, ensuring that our small to mid-sized enterprises, which again, here in the US, are sort of our life force, our lifeblood as it relates to economic development and growth, are um, able to adapt and flexi flexibly pivot. So whether that means access to capital, access to markets in terms of developing a digital presence, um, and really understanding the role that the private sector might play it involves looking again at our global supply chains related to health and food security and ensuring that we understand that, that sometimes fostering local food sources is the best way rather than the lessons learned of other um, humanitarian crises where we airlifted food into a jurisdiction and completely decimated the local economy that way. So thinking smartly about how we address these critical challenges with the lessons learned from the past and obviously the technology and the connected connectivity that social media and the internet brings is really where I feel sustainability can be more integrated and infused in international development. Um, in ways that it hasn't in the pre in, uh, in the past. Mm. And because this has been, uh, this current situation has kind of set a new precedent on how we um, handle situations like these. Do you see that you all are um, building and growing a framework that can be applied for future um, epidemics or pandemics that may that may occur? You, you, uh, you, I mean. Honestly, that is what risk management is all about. Better <laughs> performance, better governance. You know, risks are your best teacher because they provide you, you know, the worst case scenario and the upside opportunity that you might not have envisioned might actually provide, you know, a new opportunity for growth in a certain market or a new innovation where it comes to say, you know, medicines and, and, um, and that type of thing. So I think really the ex post factor evaluation of how we not just respond to risks and critical challenges uh, like, like we're facing with COVID-19, but how we take that le those lessons learned and incorporate it into the next iteration of our programming and our activities is really the work of an international development uh, professional. Um, you know, I think there's something to be said about expertise and, you know, the, the, the journey between being somebody who's a, a, an expert with drilled down knowledge in one area or a generalist. And one of the things I would say about international uh, development is the ability to sort of get involved in a number of different things and find the interconnectedness of those things and supporting sort of process and activity improvement through those experiences. And so that's what I, you know, being part of the COVID response, if you are at USAID or you're at any international development agency right now, you are part of the international COVID response, regardless of what you're doing. And so I think, you know, again, no time to really sort of take uh, that moment to reflect but there will be that and I think the after actions that come out of this will I think forever transform the landscape. Thank you for sharing that. For those of you who are just joining we're here with Miss Lydia, Lydia Nylander who is a, uh, a senior uh, risk advisor with USAID and she's sharing about uh, the current the USAID landscape right now in response to the COVID-19 situation. So thank you all for joining. If you have any questions or comments, please uh, submit them in the thread below. My next question to you, as so as we take a deep breath on COVID-19, because I'm sure we're all <laughs> overwhelmed with that word, Indeed. <laughs> um, but I'm interested to know what, where the interest, like what sparked your interest in international affairs 
and in development and in the risk management space? So um, I am a good West African daughter. I'm of Sierra Leonean descent. And so like many West African or African or fill in the blank children, you are typically given a few, you know, uh, avenues as it relates to uh, an employee, you know, a career. And so my parents were very much, um, you know, law school looks great, even at four or five years old, that that looks like a really <laughs> great path for you. <laughs> And, um, and I, you know, and I, I had a natural curiosity in terms of um, um, problem solving, but also sort of analysis and understanding, you know, the various viewpoints as it relates to things. Grew up in the UK. I'm a born and bred Londoner. <laughs> and so I'm um, going to school and, and growing up in the UK was a real eye opener in terms of all of the various sort of um, international and communities that that exist as an immigrant pathway into the UK. And so London was a fantastic place to grow up. Um, I was involved and interested in what was going on around me and what that meant. Um, you know, I grew up at, in a time where the IRA was still bombing um you know and and there were terrorist attacks in that regard so just understanding diplomacy understanding development especially coming from you know uh, sierra leonean parentage and knowing uh the the significant challenges that that particular country has had over the years i was just primed i was primed for this work <laughs> now did i take the conventional road to, to, to international development? No, I didn't. Um, I did go to law school. There is a predominance of lawyers in international development. But I was much, I was very much interested in how to resolve disputes and um, conflicts outside of the legal perspective. And so that took me on a road of understanding how alternative dispute resolution and community mediation could work as a way of resolving sort of deep seated issues. Uh, that passion came from the truth and reconciliation committees that happened in South Africa during apartheid and happened during um, the conflicts, the civil war in Sierra Leone and seeing how child soldiers who had been um, responsible for atrocities could sort of be reintegrated into society was for, and their communities was fascinating to me. So that took me on the journey to, the, to Washington DC from London. Um, and I came in and did an internship at the National Association for Community Mediation which meant that I mediated course, uh, cases at DC Superior Court. So people who came in with, um, you know, counterfeit Louis Vuitton bags all the way to <laughs> landlord and tenants, I saw, <laughs> I saw it all. Um, but I also um, had the great opportunity of going to Albuquerque and studying alternative dispute resolution in First Nation communities. And that's what really sparked this, what I say, this non-linear approach to my career and doing the things that I had passion um, and I felt a purpose doing. And so that's taken me on this very higgledy-piggledy ride. Um, but mm -hmm. what I've always um, what I always have done and what I would recommend anybody who's interested in this space and doing is just become incredibly curious about how your story and how your experience mirrors or intersects with global issues. Uh, you cannot, you know, P Peace Corps is shut down right now. Um, and the avenues for getting international experiences will be will be changing in the um you know for the next couple of years but what isn't going to change is your ability to connect food deserts in dc for example with global food insecurity 
Um, what isn't going to change is the issues around new Americans and, and immigrant populations and displaced people around the world. So making the connection around in your, in your community and your, with your story and your experience to global challenges, I think was a, a, a really, that's, that's the way that I feel like this non-linear path has uh, afforded me the skills that I, that I have today. Thank you for sharing that, Lydia, because most uh, many of our watchers of this are college age students or young professionals who may feel deterred or intimidated because they say, well, I don't have all these expansive international experiences and and uh, realize that there's a connection between the local and the international, you know, things that are international aren't as as, as far away as we think that, that they are. So thank you for sharing that. On the topic of nonlinear careers, what would you say has been the most impactful decision or step that you've taken in your professional journey? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I would say two things, really. I would say the first is stepping outside of my comfort zone. Um, you know, I worked in fundraising for a while at Greenpeace USA. Um, and I really had no idea how that was going to fit into my career path. But I, I was drawn to the idea that um, envir your, your environment is often you know an indicator to your success and some of the environmental issues that greenpeace were taking on at the, at the time interested me you know were of interest to me and how um the, those messages could be um out the outreach and engagement of those messages needed to hit uh, more diverse populations it's an it's a fantastic place to work you know i've been on the rainbow warrior i've taken you know one of these you know small speed boats and gone around you know um the west coast of, of the us i i think there is something to be said about pivoting and taking these giant leaps of faith um calculated but still leaps of faith um that you're going to learn a new skill and that you're going to be able to apply it to, you know, whatever situation there is at hand. So that would be the first thing. The second thing I would say is really tapping into a global network of mentors and professionals and experts and not being afraid to do that. Um, the power of weak ties, I think, is something that we often overlook. And when I say weak ties, I mean, um, you know, the ability to reach out to somebody and not be intimidated by, you know, a, a title or, a, or, or what they do, but something that allows them to connect with you and give you some sage advice and some, you know, lessons learned about their, their journey and their trajectory. I've done that in a number of capacities. I would definitely say there's something to be said about picking mentors who are not necessarily people you would be friends with or would go out. Hi, we have you back. Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, okay. <laughs> people who may even actually fit into an executive coaching capacity. I would definitely say those two things, so not being afraid to take those leaps and really exercising properly and with thought and care and extended network have been the two sort of major game changers for me. 
Thank you for sharing that. I'd like to quickly shout out. So I saw some of our BPIA board members um, are on the call. So I'm shouting out Vannery Kong. I saw her on as well as some of our uh, previous BPIA chat speakers. So I see Byron L. Williams on. Give <laughs> a shout out. Byron, uh, my fellow I <laughs> <laughs> Byron, who is essentially the plug, if you will, in, in international great. development and international affairs space. Um, so my next question is, what do you like most about your work or the work that you're doing now? What I like the most about the work I do is that every day is eventful. Every day has a purpose behind it. The, the passion behind uh, the delivery of foreign assistance takes you to a number of different places. You know, if you think about it, we work and the motto of USAID is from the American people. So it is important to me as a immigrant, as somebody who claims a lot of intersectionality and finds herself here in, you know, in Maryland, that we are good financial stewards of the financial assistance that we, that we send abroad. Conversely, it's also very important that those, uh, those funds do what is intended and support our beneficiaries as they move towards um, self-reliance, you know, sustainability and local ownership. And so, um, you know, oftentimes I've been in roles, I, I'm sure this is, people also feel this way, that you've, you're wondering how what you do fits into the bigger picture. And um, I'm, I'm reminded of that every day, whether it's, you know, locally hearing people talk about the impact that USAID has made in the lives of their family and friends, or if it's, you know, just the camaraderie and the, the expertise and the dedication that I see in my fellow colleagues. So I would definitely say that that's, um, you know, one area. I would also say that things are just, it's never boring. You're constantly working on different things. And I think um, the, the need to be nimble and flexible uh, is never, never more true than in this space. So for those that sort of have that kind of career ADHD or ADD and like to sort of move around, I think you can, yeah, here. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's an eventful, fun, high moving, fast paced type of work. And so, yeah, those are, the, those are my takeaways on the days where I'm exhausted. I'm like, okay, I put in my 12 hours today. Hi, thank you for that. Hi, everyone. I see some, we have some new folks who are joining. We're here with senior risk advisor, Miss Lydia, who is sharing her experience during her time at USAID and her other professional experiences. I see we have a shout out here um, to you from someone who has worked with you for many years and that and expresses that you have exhibited a wealth of knowledge in your profession. So that is, that is awesome to hear. So for anyone who has any comments or questions, please continue to put them in the thread. Um, in time, I will continue to ask questions. So my next question to you, Lydia, is, is there anything that you know now that you wish you knew when you first started this career path? That's a great question. Um, I would definitely say there are the tried and tested ways of getting into the, you know, whether it's the foreign service or international affairs um, or, or international diplomacy. And even though I'm talking about a non-linear approach, um, I, you know, I, I think in, in hindsight, it would have been good for me to just kind of know how these mechanisms work and to, to be more aware of how I could have used that I could have used them to my disposal at my disposal. I think I would have also appreciated, you know, some of the professional development programs that are really geared towards fashioning and, um, you know, supporting that new cadre of international development and diplomacy folks. I would have probably taken more advantage of, of those activities. 
but you know I was too busy sort of riding on ships and uh working <laughs> at the black press and um <laughs> being involved in all of that stuff excuse um, me and saving the world <laughs> yes, you know. um but I also I think also it's not it's about it's not it's about being unapologetic and not being so concerned about what you don't know but being able to make that connection that I talked about earlier so a natural curiosity about how things work and how they can be improved is a universal skill tact and diplomacy being able to write well being able to be persuasive being able to be a good communicator all of those things can be learnt on the job and and will will um will be important aids in anybody's uh international development career and so i think you know initially i think there was some reticence in reaching out to senior leaders and reaching out to people that I would, you know, appreciate their counsel or their support. And now I am famous for saying, you know, squeaky wheels get the oil. You really mm. have to be willing to, to say, you know, I don't know everything, but I'm eager and I'm excited and I'm interested and I see how this connects with this and and what do you think? And I think LinkedIn and other me um, mechanisms for connecting people, but also having people sort of have a good discourse about, you know, global challenges are really great ways to enter the fray without being afraid of, you know, stepping on anybody's toes or, you know, hierarchy. Get over all that. Um, people appreciate good ideas and they appreciate, you know, thoughtful dialogue and discourse. And, and so that will never go out of style. Thank you for that. We have a question from a viewer that asks, what are important professional development skills that individuals should uh, acquire specifically in the international development and the international affairs space? So you may, I, I feel like you just mentioned, I didn't want the person to think I was ignoring their question. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> but because you basically just laid it out for us, I don't think yeah. that it needs to be uh, a re 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 answer but you know how you mentioned tact diplomacy communication skills ability to write well i think that those things are both relevant in international development but absolutely relevant across the spectrum of international affairs uh careers sure. that exist I, I so because add, we have enough, oh, I, go ahead. I, I would just add that on the writing um definitely learning how to write succinctly you know, unfortunately, it's not very sexy, but <laughs> most of the work that we do is responding to, um, you know, papers, writing memos, trying to be persuasive and succinct in, in the information that we are, you know, funneling up the chain. And so the proof is in the pudding. Great writers and great, you know, people who are able to analyze and cogently write, um, you know, write and speak. You, you, you just can't, yeah, you can't, I, I can't overstate that. Yes, agreed, agreed. So because we have another um, BBI chat speaker oh. following this one, I'd like to ask this last question and then ask that you include any concluding thoughts um, that you may have. But what advice do you have, Lydia, for someone who was considering this particular career path, this type of job, or entering this field? I would say it is it is a, a really rewarding um career path to be to be you know involved in currently at this time even as exhausting as it is it is definitely worthwhile knowing that we are working um, and supporting a glo a, a coordinated global response to a pandemic you know how many people can really say that they are on the front lines of that type of work um, globally not many so it's definitely a privilege I would definitely say that um, 
it's it's an important um, avenue to think about how you want to show up in the space, how you want to make a difference. Um, become, as I said, actively curious about how the work that you've done in the past has been um, connects to this to this global um, you know global situation, and think about how you know the people around you are affected by what's happening. So. Again, I think COVID is going to change the landscape as it relates to international jobs and international careers. But I think there is actually an opportunity here for people to look at the types of skills that are transferable and use the, and, and, and work on sort of supporting those types of initiatives here in the homeland. And so if there are opportunities to support your neighbor, your community, um, you know, diaspora communities, look for those transferable skills that say, yes, I supported this population of people. I can do that abroad. I can do that regionally. I can do that in other capacities. So again, I wouldn't, I would say that um, even though travel is probably going to look differently, international development skills and diplomacy skills will be um, definitely du jour. And again, happy to help anybody think through their possibilities in the space. It's been a very rewarding journey for me. And again, happy to support anybody who's looking at this as a career path. Lydia, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. I know this is a busy time. Um, <laughs> Indeed. So we really appreciate you speaking to us. Um, would you mind sharing the best way to get in contact with you, whether it's LinkedIn or through Instagram, however you prefer? Absolutely. So on LinkedIn, you can find me as Lydia Nylander. Um, you can also find me on um, Instagram at the same and I also uh, co-host a podcast on um, entrepreneurship and scaling and financing funding called WTF, Where's the Funding? So you can also find me there. And, um, you know, again, I'm, I'm easy to find. So please <laughs> reach out if you, do, if you can. LinkedIn is probably the best for me, but you'll find me. Lydia, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who, to all of our watchers today. So this video will be posted on our IGTV and our YouTube following this uh, live stream. So we look forward to seeing you all at our future BPIA uh, chats and our future BPIA uh, in-person events and programming thank in the future. Thank you so much. BPIA is great. Really uh, proud to be a part of this and uh, looking forward to continuing to connect. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, everyone. Have a good day. Stay safe. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.